right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Data Council and Pete for allowing me to speak here. <clears throat> so my name is Nick Schrock. I'm a founder of a company called Elemental. But what I'm going to be talking about today is our first project, and it's an open source project called Dagster. And this is the first time we've been able to talk about it in public. Uh, so it's a super exciting day for us. <clears throat> so just a little about me. I want to step back and talk about why I'm here. So I spent the bulk of my career at Facebook, and I actually worked at Facebook working on frameworks for our product developers. So externally, I'm best known as the co-creator of GraphQL. I <laughs> uh, won't be talking about GraphQL today, but that's kind of what I'm known for. And you know, it's really been an honor to watch that become an open source technology that's really broadly adopted. And it's really kind of, I think, demonstrated the power of not just technological transformation, but using technology to change the dynamics within an organization. So I left Facebook in February 2017. And I started going around and talking to companies about what their problems are, technically. And I was talking to people both inside the valley and outside the valley. This kept on, they kept on saying this over and over again. Our data is totally broken. And I found that very confusing. So I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, what do you actually mean by that? When you dig into it, you start hearing phrases like, we don't know where the data comes from. We have no idea what it means. We have no idea how to reliably process it. We don't know how to test it. Our engineers don't even want to touch this stuff. And it's not fun. It's not sexy. And my confusion got deeper because I have been told by reliable sources that data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. So then the next step is to go talk to data scientists. And so what did, what did, you're a data scientist. What do you actually do day to day? And the answer is invariably something like this. I just convert JSON to uh, Python dictionaries and back. Uh, and... <laughs> So th this is an interesting journey to explore. And a more common formulation is something like this. You hear this at almost every talk you ever go to, which is, I spend 20% of my time doing my job and 80% of my time doing data cleaning. Now, I found this to be a curious formulation because the implication is that everything which is not their job is data cleaning which is very strange. And so I think this was actually one of the cases where people were saying one thing because of the pain they're experiencing, but they're actually diagnosing a far deeper problem. So when people talk about data cleaning, they're talking about all sorts of stuff, right? They're talking about rolling their own infrastructure, right? Common workflow for a data scientist in today's world is you give them a CSV file and a Jupyter notebook, and you're like, do stuff. That is crazy. That's actually, everyone's used to it, but it actually is insane that that's what we do. Data scientists realize instinctively that a lot of the work they do is repeated, meaning like in kind of an ecosystem way. Like they're doing work that someone else probably should have done. And then at the end of the day, they often have to maintain these unreliable processes that they haven't tested and they don't really know how to productionize. And I think when people say data cleaning, they basically mean all sorts of activities like this. Then you go and talk to a business leader. You're like, all right, data's broken. Tell me what that means. And they say something like this. Our data projects fail all the time. Right? It, failure is the norm, which is also kind of crazy. So to summarize the state of things, you got engineers saying, I don't want to touch this stuff. You got data scientists, and they tell me they're wasting all their time. And then the leader's saying that it just it never works. This is where we are. This is kind of the state of things. The people in this room are kind of at the upper, upper echelon of technology here, right? A lot of people here build a ton of custom infrastructure, so they succeed more than the norm. But this is kind of the state of everything. And so as I was kind of taking stock of this landscape, this actually reminded me something. You're going to have to bear with me here. It actually reminded me of conversations I had 10 years ago with people writing UIs. So if you talk to someone in 2009, they would likely say something like this. I spend 80% of my time 
fighting the browser and 20% of my time building my app. Now, if you were around in 2009 and within screaming distance of a UI engineer, you'd start hearing pain yelling at their screens about IE6, right? This is what they were dealing with. But it was interesting, well, uh, skipping here. So you would hear things like this, right? We can't change our UI, we can't test it, breaks all the time, right? Our engineers don't want to touch it. And when they do, all they do is they hop into the code base, make something fly around the screen, and then get the hell out. And then it breaks a week later, right? That was the state of things. Fast forward to today, front end engineering is incredible. Now, you might, you might get a different impression from some of the chatter on Twitter, but in the reality of things, it is a very healthy ecosystem. Like working in a full modern JavaScript stack is a, a magical experience. And yes, the browsers did get better. But I would argue that it wasn't decisive. It was the software abstractions that were built on top of the browsers that truly transformed the trajectory and totally changed the trajectory of this ecosystem. So systems like Angular, systems like Vue.js, and then systems like React. Right? React, React was kind of the, in my, I'm probably biased, but it was the, I think, decisive abstraction that changed the course of this whole ecosystem. Both Angular and Vue now essentially define themselves in opposition or in response to React. And so what, was, what, what made React so good? And one thing about it is that React acknowledged the complexity of the problem they were solving. You weren't just scripting a web page. You were building a full application with all the complexity therein. And React provided abstractions and formalisms that matched that complexity. And then beyond technology, React respected the discipline. So front end before React in the late 2000s was kind of this software engineering backwater. And there was often kind of a lack of respect and almost kind of a self-deprecation in that field. And that is no longer true anymore. The systems that are built in front end are real. Lots of engineers like to engage in that ecosystem. It is truly a world transformed. So React ushered us into this world of building these fully fledged, well abstracted front end applications. And I would argue that we're on the cusp of a new era in data. Right? We're, building, we're not just building a bunch of disconnected scripts that are stitched together with a workflow engine. Right? These are full applications. They're, they're alive. They're extraordinarily complex, built with a huge heterogeneous array of tools, built by a bunch of different personas. They are incredibly complicated. And I would argue that they're, they're, the abstractions and systems that are operating the ecosystem today don't live up to the underlying complexity that we're actually dealing with. And so what, we're, what Dagster is trying to do is being part of this journey of kind of moving this domain forward from not just a bunch of disconnected pipelines, but instead to be building full data applications. So some core principles here. So at Facebook, I started a team called Product Infrastructure, which ended up creating React. I didn't work on React, but I was you know, within shouting distance of them. And I worked on GraphQL. But we had kind of these timeless principles that I think really apply to what we're building here in the data domain. So one is that this kind of goes without saying is that you're solving a real problem. I'm gonna get it. We're going to talk about the rest of the time to see if I can prove to you that we are solving a real problem here. But in terms of process, there's just a few things I think are utterly critical. One is an incremental adoption path. So very typically in the data domain, people want to provide these fully vertically integrated stacks that replace a whole bunch of things at the same time. It's not a realistic approach. You need to be able to pick off things one system, one task at a time. You want to preserve the tools that work. You have made huge investments. Notebooks, Spark, data warehouses, Airflow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're not going to be asked to abandon those overnight. And then immediate value, pro value and productivity gains. So yes, there's a long-term vision where like, there's going to be some glorious end state with data applications that work perfectly. But in the short term, you have to install this thing and get immediate value. All right, so these are kind of these core principles. So I've been talking for a long time. You're probably actually wondering, what, 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 are, you, what are you actually talking about? What are you doing? 
So we're going to get to code very, very soon here. But we're building data applications. How would I define that? So everyone uses all this terminology. They like separate ETL and ML into two different boxes. I found that very confusing, because if you look at an ML engineer and an ETL engineer, they are doing the same thing. Just at the end of a supervised learning process, there's a model. And an ETL, there's like a data warehouse table or file. But regardless of what they're doing, they're doing this. You are building a graph of functions that ingest and produce data assets. That is the core problem that's trying to solve. So that is the core abstraction on which Dagster is built. So without further ado, let's pip install this thing and see what the hell I'm talking about. So you open up a code editor, and we're going to do hello world here. So we import a pipeline and a solid. So a pipeline is just a DAG of what we call solids. And a solid, you can approximate, is just a unit of functional computation. Fancy word for function. In this case, we're just going to log hello world into this context object that we flow throughout the computation. And once you kind of structure your code like this, you immediately get tooling out of the box. So we're going to launch this tool that we call Dagit. All right, so we open up and we have this web tool, and boom. You can view your pipeline right here. Right? Isn't it beautiful UI? Really nice. Uh, the team has done amazing work here. Uh, and so you can start your execution here. We'll go through all this slower later. But in the end, there it is. Classic computer science, blinking light demo. Okay? So Daggett serves as this kind of like development environment. I think one of the things we can do in order to provide a ton of value is dramatically improve the local development experience. Right? right now, the norm is to develop in production, which is kind of insane. Uh, and, so, and as we go through this, we're going to kind of hop back and talk about what we've introduced here. So we've introduced the notion of a pipeline, which is a directed acyclic graph of solids, and then a solid, which is a unit of functional computation. All right. Well, hello world is cute, but let's actually adapt a real example with real living, breathing code into the system. So we're going to take the public example of running, uh, running PageRank on PySpark and adapt it into our system. So here's this existing code. It's a command line utility. It takes a file path and a number of iterations. Right? It calls a function with those arguments. And now we're going to do some stuff up here. So we initialize the Spark context. We load in a file. We do some compute on it. We actually do the page rank algorithm. And then we go through and we print out the results of this. Right? Pretty straightforward PySpark code if you ever dealt with it. Now what we're going to do is do the best code reuse strategy of all time, which is copy and paste it in here. Um, and then we're going to make this a Dijkstra pipeline. So we're going to add a few concepts up here <coughs> so that we can actually do what we want to do. We're going to kill the old solid. And then we're going to make this existing, this existing function we brought in we're going to make this thing a solid. So it's just a plain old Python function, and we annotate it, and we make it a so-called solid. Now we mark with metadata an input. So we have an input, which is a file path. Okay. And then we also have a notion of configuration. So input is equivalent to data, whereas configuration more configures how something is comp uh, computed. Very concretely, inputs can come from previous computations in the DAG. You'll see why we did that in a second. So we add our context object, and instead of getting iterations of argument, we're going to get it as configuration. And then we hop down here. Instead of printing it out, we're going to log it to that context object that we provide. And that's it. We've adapted page rank <coughs> to our system. Hop in here, load it up. You'll notice that all the meta information that we've encoded in the program is surfaced. Here, so there's a path right here. There's a configuration down here. And as a result of providing those things, boom, now we have this auto-completing type ahead. And you'll see as we type ahead, we get live errors about what's going on, right? No more searching through random JSON config files that God knows what they do when they break, right? You have a very well-structured config system that automatically schematizes high-quality errors, et cetera, right? You log this, we can filter down to debug, and we're printing out stuff to the screen. Okay, so this is looking pretty cool. Let's go to the next thing. So, all right, I'm getting too far ahead of myself here. So, solids have inputs, they also have outputs, probably a 
a little bit of a mission on this screen. Uh, and they also have configuration. OK. What's next? Well, what we're going to do, and you're not supposed to read this, but effectively what we're going to do is take this one function and break it into two functions. Okay, so we're going to separate it into loading the data and executing on it. So we have these two function signatures here. And what we have to do now to make this a coherent pipeline is connect them together with a dependency. Okay, so what we're going to do here is add a thing to our pipeline definition. There we go. You notice this dependencies dictionary down here. Now, if you're familiar with a system like Airflow, Airflow just has a dependency graph between tasks, whereas this is a dependencies between the way the data flows through the system. So if you notice here, our dependency graph says like, hey, I have this input, it's called links. I want you to get it from the output of that previous computation, right, and stitch that together. Um, and so that actually gives us a lot of power. So we go back here. Now we zoom into this, and we see that the inputs and outputs are connected. right? Go here and execute it. Our config file is actually divided. Sorry, that was too fast. And now we're going to show that, so we can execute this thing. We're going to complete that execution. But then we can actually go back and select a subset of the DAG. So we have this solid subselection thing where we can be like, hey, I only want to execute part of this graph now. The configuration schema is dynamic based on what you selected. And now we can execute, and we just executed one piece of this thing. All right, so now we have dependencies. We're able to stitch these solids together into a dependency graph of compute. So what's next? So you notice in the code that we newed up a Spark session directly. And what we think is a really, really important concept is to separate your business logic from your environmental concerns. And that means what we want to do is have the system manage the Spark session for you. Okay? It makes the code more testable. It also has some other uh, nice benefits as well. The way we're going to do that, and you notice that instead of directly accessing the Spark session, we actually hang it off our context down there. OK? So yeah, there's also ecosystem of libraries. So from the Dagster PySpark library, which we also released today, uh, you can import a Spark session resource. And the details here don't matter. But the key thing is that we're configuring it so that, hey, there's a resource, and it's called Spark, and it's a Spark session resource. All right, now, how many of you have written a Spark job or interacted with Spark at all? All right, how many of you have struggled with configuring Spark? All right, that's 100% hit rate. Well, that, this, combined with the config editor, uh, if you don't like this, I, I don't understand how your mind works. Uh, the <laughs> so we can scope this out, right? We've added some type information. Now there's this config schema down here, right? And so what we've done is we've imported the entire Spark configuration schema, right? We're gonna, we have to click down to this thing, boom, 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 and then all of a sudden, bam, right? The entire Spark config schema with embedded documentation all right there, right? You can vouse over it. Stuff happens. You can all see there's an error at the same time. Oh, that's a, you know, it's a number. We expected a string. And on and on and on. Right? This is a highly generic config editing system, of which Spark is one example target. Right? It's a very pluggable system. You can add your own config schema. Now we're executing this thing. Oh, look. There's foobar. It's right there. We configured it properly. OK. So now the other thing this enables is the ability to re-execute specific parts of our pipeline. We're actually going to configure this to automatically persist the intermediate materializations of this pipeline, and we're going to inject an error. So what we're simulating here is like, you're running a pipeline, it's been running for a while, and then the last task fails. You're like, oh god, now I have to rerun this entire thing. It's a nightmare. So we just reran this thing. It's going to pop up an error. We have this nice rendering, so you can go get your stack trace, go to what line of code you're dealing with. Now look at this. We can just re-execute this single thing. Right? We think this capability is just a massive leap forward for local development in a super practical way. This is a super practical problem that every data domain person interacts with. So there, we fix the problem. We re-execute just that thing. And uh, boom. Executing, we have 
it's green again, right? Super powerful tooling. So we've added these concepts. And this is not meant to be kind of, this is a lot of stuff to absorb. So, you know, and this, the goal of this is not for you to be able to look at this thing and immediately go and start developing on it. But we're giving you a sense of how these abstractions interleave in order to provide real value to our users. OK, so just to sum up, oh, wait, wait, wait. Got out of order here. So one, I think one really useful way to evaluate these new technologies is to orient it to other existing technologies. Where does this fit into the ecosystem? So we have our centralized abstraction called Dexter. We have a Python implementation of it, a Python library that you pip install. And we've demonstrated how we have integrations with PySpark underneath it. By adopting the abstraction, you get these beautiful high quality tools, right? It's kind of a suite of tools called Dagit, but they're pretty independent. We have the config editor, the DAG viewer, our execution console. The way we've written this, we've written it over an API. And the API is really what this system as, is in its core. So what does this API do? Well, as I described before, we describe a data application as a graph of functional compute. And what does that allow you to do? We can query those graph of functions. We can introspect on them, figure out what the shape of it is. We can actually, over this API, operate them, meaning that we can both configure and execute those computations. And then also, over that API, we can monitor them. Right? So we, we have this live subscription service. This stuff happens to be implemented on GraphQL for obvious reasons, but it not, it's not you know, directly linked to the system. It's actually an inc incidental fact about it. But it's these core capabilities that are the most important thing. And so Dexter is not just a set of tools. Because it's an open API, using an open standard, if you adopt this thing, you can also build your own internal tools on this abstraction. So this ends up being a platform for tool building. Go back here. And now, all right, Spark developers here. How many people use PySpark primarily? And how many people use Scala, Spark, Java, Spark? OK, so this is for you. Is that, OK, PySpark's cute, but I'm a real Spark developer. I use, I use Scala. This is, this is Python. This is a joke. Well, just so happens we can also script Python, you know, Spark computations written in Scala. And then we can also, you know, by the word functional compute is chosen very carefully, meaning like a coarse grained function, i.e., a Spark job, a database, you know, a SQL query that, say, creates a table or some other artifact. So let's demonstrate that. So we have out of the box these Spark solids and Snowflake solids, just as examples. Uh, they're not kind of ready to go industrial strength. It's more for the demo, but it shows the promise of the system. So now we have a pipeline that is more realistic. It ingests events. So we download a file from S3. It unzips that file. You know, look at all this embedded documentation. Um, and then what it does is it actually ingests that event, produces Parquet files using Spark. And we have these things called asset tags where we can actually embed meta information and be like, hey, this is the, this is the Java class that actually does this. We also have a auto-completing, no, auto a syntax highlight SQL editor, right? So you can kind of get full context in your pipeline. So now we execute this thing. So this is actually doing a Spark submit, as you can see in the middle there. And this is actually executing a database load. And because this is all built on that same API layer, right? even though it's multilingual, we can use the same features that we had before. We just re-executed the Snowflake load independently. Right? Imagine you had done something dumb and mistyped the SQL query. And SQL is dynamic, so you can't check it ahead of time. Um, and so boom, we've integrated that. So just to take a beat here for a second, We've demonstrated how this is an open source Python library. It is available right now. We've actually been developing out in the, this out in the open the whole time. It has these multilingual integrations and this out-of-the-box beautiful tooling. But just to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, what about those data scientists? You haven't really addressed that yet. And you know, what is the problem happening in data science today? What, 
you know, what problem are we think is most important? Well, essentially it's this, is that the current status quo in most organizations is that data science and engineering are just two sealed, siloed world. The data scientists do some work over here, they present their model, throw it over the proverbial wall, it's up to the engineers to implement and productionize it, the engineers don't understand the model. The data, science don't answer, the data science folks don't understand the productionization issues. It's a pretty pathological situation, actually. Unleashes a bunch of negative organizational dynamics. Where you want to get to is here, where they, the disciplines are respected, and there's aspects of them that overlap, but they also do their own individual activities. That overlap is cultural, but it's driven by underlying changes in tooling. So I don't think you talk about the chasm between data science and engineering without talking about Jupyter. Right? Jupyter is the de facto environment in which data scientists do their work. And there's two schools of thought about Jupyter. There's this one. I don't like them. It's actually a great talk. It's very entertaining. Uh, I used to be in this camp. And for the predictable reasons that a grumpy engineer, it's like, oh, it's not reproducible. I'm not storing things in files. I can't test this. It's this insane out of order execution model that's hyper stateful. Like, you people are out of your minds. But then you see the way people use them, it's clearly valuable. So I was trying to grapple with this. And then actually, Matt, who's over there, and his team wrote this blog post, which I thought was extraordinary. And if you saw his talk yesterday, he gave a great summary of the technology, and it's called Paper Mill. Simply put, it allows you to execute a notebook as a function. <laughs> and then I saw this, and I'm like, well, golly gee, I'm you know, working on a framework where the fundamental unit thing I'm building is a coarse-grained function, a functional computation. So like, let's make one of these paper notebooks, paper mill notebooks, a solid. So we're going we're gonna to extend the example pipeline we had that ended with the SQL statement, but we're actually going to do a computation to take that table and make it a data frame. And then we're going to pass it to a notebook. Right, so this is a notebook solid. And you can write in line and dag it, see what's going on, right? see this computation that your data science person has crafted. But how do you actually integrate that into pipeline? What does that mean? And this is where paper mill kick, kicks in. So if you check out this notebook, it looks like a normal notebook. You can do all your insane out of order execution to your heart's content, right? So we just injected an error, we fix it, we recompute it. You have to keep track of the order of operations here. But this is what the paper mill magic. So there's a parameter cell. And what you can essentially say is like, hey, at runtime, what we want to do is instead of executing this notebook, we're going to remove that cell and inject a new cell with the production data. That's how that works. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So use the same tools. Now this is going to execute the thing. Blah, 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 blah. It's loading into the snowflake. Just did a Spark job. Does some computation to produce a data frame. And now we're executing a notebook. And then you'll see this thing. It produced an output notebook. So what the output notebook is, is it copy-paste job of the original notebook, but with the production data in it. And we just clicked on it, copied the location where that output note was generated, output notebook was generated. And now we can view this in your, in your tool of choice. Right, so here we're just going to open it up in a notebook. And so this is actually a, a, an output of the pipeline. And it serves as a rich log of computation. So all of the charting and graphing that your data scientists have done can actually be used in production logging. And it also serves as the debugging environment. So whether or not Dagster succeeds or not, I think that paper mill, if it you know, grows like I think it should, should revolutionize the way that data scientists do their work. Uh, I think it's an extraordinary advance. And we want to integrate with those technologies. So we add another family of tech underneath within the Dagster family. So let's dig into what's going on here. So what's interesting about this, and if you're at Julian's talk just before me, he set this up perfectly, where actually we have many, many different personas interacting with our pipelines. So we have data engineers, analysts, data science, data scientists, et cetera, collaborating to build a single graph of functional compute, right, data application. 
Those computations are accessible behind an API. And that's how we built these first party tools. And then we come out of the box with a very simple local executor, right? So we can execute these things on our machine. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, this looks cute. A lot of fancy pants, hipstery web tools. I'm interested in using this, but I have my existing stuff. I have an Airflow cluster. How the hell am I going to use this new thing with that? Well, turns out that what we can do, since it's kind of structured on top of an API, is that we can query that graph of computations and then dynamically synthesize an Airflow DAG. Right? So you can encode your DAGs, DAGster space, and then effectively view Airflow as sort of a compilation target. So what does that look like? That's it. We import our pipeline. We point it to the configurations that power this pipeline. And then we call a function which makes a DAG. That's it. We're done. We just did it. Uh, we also have an option for automatically containerized. Thanks. Max just got all pumped up. He's uh, Mr. Mr. Data Engineer 2012 through 15. Uh, <laughs> And so now, we, you know, we put this in our DAG loading script that Airflow runs, and we can load it in the web server. And along with all the examples, which everyone knows, <laughs> they come with, come with the system, boom, there it is. There's our DAG, native in Airflow. So we've demonstrated how we can go to this kind of, from this compelling local development environment, integrating all these different tools, then very easily completing the story by making it very straightforward to deploy this to Airflow. So let's sum this back up here. So data engineering, you know, last year this conference was called Data EngConf. And you know, we, it's been rebranded to Data Council to include data scientists. Um, but I think also part of the reason it was rebranded is that data engineering is still an emerging discipline, I would say. And you kind of see this because there's title arbitrage happening where people are data engineers, but they're like, no, 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 no. I'm a machine learning engineer, even though you're doing the same exact thing that you did last week, right? So I think people are still kind of figuring out how to define what data engineering means and what its eventual end state's going to be. And it's at an inflection point. And our thesis is that inflection point is that we're moving from assembling scripts in kind of this one-off way to more full-fledged applications. Complicated, they're alive, they're hard to keep up and running. And so we're trying to address this with kind of a you know, three-pronged attack, I guess. One is this new, what we like to think is an elegant programming model. And then you can leverage that programming model to use this new beautiful tooling that we think really adds a lot, especially to the local developer experience. And then it's a flexible and incremental approach. Right? We demonstrated how it's integrating with all the tooling that you depend on, both in terms of how you're modeling your compute, whether it's Spark, a data warehouse, or a notebook, and also being able to deploy to your existing infrastructure in a permissionless way. Right? You could actually synthesize an Airflow DAG using the system. You wouldn't even tell your ops team. Right? It's kind of this bottoms-up adoption approach. And I just want to dig into the flexible and incremental bit for a second. What does that mean? It means you can use your tools. It means you can preserve your existing investments in your code. And it means you can deploy to your infrastructure. And it means you can adopt incrementally. Right? These are critical, critical qualities for any successful technology. But there's obviously a ton of work to do. Um, you know, where we're at right now is that you know, we have one alpha user who's in the audience today, Abe Gong, that you saw him at the panel, and his company's super conductive. But there's obviously a ton of work to do. Uh, we have a small team, super talented team. They're over there, uh, Max, Nate, and Alex. And they've just done, you know, extraordinary work on this project. We also have other members who have, who have been working on the team. Ben and Mikhail are responsible for that UI, uh, which really is uh, really, really nice to work with. And then Uma worked with us, uh, has been working with us to actually build the Dagster Mill system. Um, and she's done extraordinary work too. And then I would like to thank 
Abe and Superconductive Health for being our alpha user and uh, yeah, really rolling with the punches here. Um, so, next steps here. One, this is you know, open source today. You can download and try it out. But what we're really looking for is one, we're still building our founding team. So we're hiring, if you're interested, talk to me. But we're also looking for a kind of, I've heard a few terms for this, like design partner, founding customer. But essentially what we're looking for is two to three teams that we can work with, deeply embed with those teams to assist them in building their infrastructure using this tooling. And then, yeah, you can always reach me by email. And uh, that's my Twitter handle and a handle on everything else. And without 30, that's it, I'm done. So thank you very much. Awesome talk. Um, thank you. I guess I, my first really big question is, um, well, you refer in your example to input.txt, not immutable, right? Because that's a reference to an outside resource, auto right. file system somewhere, or even database queries, not immutable. What is your plan for your Redux to your React? Wow, that's, a, that's an insider baseball question. Um, so the, I think the, the, what we will do is, yes, the input artifacts are not immutable, but the system is configured to be able to effectively take over kind of effectively a folder or a bucket in S3 and use that to persist all the intermediate uh, artifacts that you end up computing. Uh, so that you, you, you end up being able to configure the system to have this immutable log of all the data that you've operated on, right? And you could extend that by making it easy to copy the data that comes in externally into this, like an inputs folder into that, so that then you can do that Redux trick where you can kind of like replay what happened in a very deterministic fashion. I think as we go forward, you know, there will be opportunities, especially if we stack this on top of containerization, to be able to do things like hash the inputs and be like, oh, I've seen this before and I've computed this before with this container, so you can do like minimum viable recompute. Um, we have the software formalisms in place to do that, but that was a great question. Yeah. And follow-up question on the other side. So outputs, like let's say you send email notifications and things like that, um, obviously those are side affecting to the outside world, they're not um, rollbackable, mm -hmm. and so what's, do you have a plan for the equivalent of an Haskell I.O. monad to? <laughs> well, this is a hard one to answer because after 15 years or however long I've been in the industry, I still have no idea what a monad is. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, our kind of approach here is not to be overly restrictive with the programming model being like, there are no side effects ever. That's not realistic. That's not the way these systems work. Our request is that the systems don't lie. Uh, meaning that you can, yes, you can declare your outputs, but we also have this ability for the solids to kind of indicate, like we call them materializations. We can be like, hey, by the way, I emitted this thing. You know, that's exactly actually how that output notebook works. The, 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 no, the solid emitted the fact that like, hey, I produce this materialization that's over here. Like render that in your UI at a minimum, but Later as we build the system, we'll be able to build formalisms to capture that. But we can't solve item potence for you. You know, like if you email, if in the middle you're, you know, it's a Python program or whatever program, if you decide to email someone, I mean the email went out, we can't, we, you know, we can't fix that. Um, so there are side effects in the world. We will try to build abstractions. We'll have abstractions to kind of model them, but we can't solve the issue um, at that level. <laughs> 